Okay, let's read the text, Revelation chapter 20. We're going to be dealing with the millennium. What in the world is the millennium? And I, I've entitled my lesson, Millennium Generation. Because as you know, I take that generation of, of saints in the first century from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. as the millennium. So millennium generation, that's where we're going to be headed. But notice what he says in Revelation 20, verses 1 and following. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, notice John does not stop and explain this new term that's not found anywhere else in the New Testament called the millennium. He doesn't stop and say, oh, by the way, I'm introducing a new term to you today. It's called the millennium, and here's what that is. Notice he doesn't, doesn't stop to explain it. Now, why? What, what does that assume? That assumes that his readers would understand what that is. And John knew that his readers understood that terminology. Otherwise, he would have stopped to explain it to us. So, back 40 years ago, when I first became a full preterist, Revelation was the way I became a preterist, by the way. It was studying through the Bible. I read the whole Bible through twice in six months' time. And as I closed the book of Revelation, that second reading through, I prayed to God. I said, if there's one thing I want you to do in my life is help me understand this book. And part of the reason for that statement was Revelation chapter 20, the millennium. That was such a tough one for me. And so I began to realize that John doesn't explain what this millennium is. He's assuming his readers already understood it. And that means that the Jewish people in the first century were evidently using that very terminology in their Bible study. It was something that they were familiar with. And so I said, well, then I'll have to go back to the first century Jewish writings to see if there's anything said in those writings outside the Bible, which would tell us what this millennium idea is. And sure enough, when I went to the Talmudic writings, the Midrash, and the Zokar, there's hundreds of references to the Messiah's millennium. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But his readers evidently were already familiar with it, and John knew that. So... If we're going to understand it like they did, we have to go back to the first century and read those writings and see what they said. Now, there's a fellow by the name of Abraham Kohane, who's supposedly a descendant of one of the priests. He's not a Christian, but he wrote a book called Every Man's Talmud, and we have it on our book list, and some of you probably have it. Uh, but in that book, he talks about the various rabbinical ideas regarding the Messiah. 
And in his section on the Messiah and the end of days, he makes a statement here about the uh, understanding of the rabbis in regard to those periods of time. Uh, the rabbis broke up the world into two ages or two worlds. Uh, the Olam Hazeh, which is this world, and the Olam Haba, which is the world to come. Now, the Greek word ionos, which is translated age in the Greek, the Greeks had uh, a lot more packed into that meaning than we Westerners do. We Westerners think of an age as just an age of time. But the Greeks, and especially the Jews, understood that as, as not only an age of time, but as a place or a condition or a world order. And so the Jewish people, and especially in the Old Testament, understood that there was this world order and another world order yet to come that the Messiah will usher in. And between this age or world and the age to come or world to come, there would be a transition period. And the Messiah would close out the old age and usher in the new age or new world. And they referred to that transitionary stage between this world and the world to come as the Messiah's millennium or as the days of the Messiah. And I want to read some of the comments here that Abraham Cohen makes in his book. Uh, rabbis generally agreed that there was three basic eras of God's redemptive work. This world, the days of the Messiah, and the world to come. They did not agree on how long this world and the days of the Messiah would last, but they all seemed to agree that the world to come would last forever. Most rabbis felt that the days of the Messiah would either be the last days of this world or an intermediate, intermediate period of time between this age and the age to come. Now, if you are aware of it, in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles, especially Paul, uh, refer to this age and the age to come. And you can detect how they understood Jesus in reference to those two ages. They viewed Jesus as the Messiah and that he was already in his days of the Messiah or his millennium of the Messiah, closing out the old age, which was already obsolete, and growing old and ready to disappear, and bringing in the age to come. And so think about the way the New Testament frames that in response to these rabbis and what they were having to say. There were different opinions about the days of the Messiah and what it would be like and how much good would actually be experienced in those days versus how much would be saved for that world to come. The following quotes from Abraham Cohen's book show that there were some pre-Christian rabbis who taught the idea of a transition period of 40 years. And that this transition period, which was called the days of, of the Messiah or the Messiah's millennium, uh, was also labeled uh, as a millennium or a thousand years. Therefore, a, the preterist idea of a 40-year millennium has to be considered as a possible if not probable interpretation of the millennium text in Revelation 20. Here's what those rabbis had to say about that. He says, many rabbis believe that the period of the Messiah was to be only a transitionary stage between this world 
and the world to come. And opinions differed on its duration. The rabbis would ask, how long will the days of the Messiah last? Rabbi Akiba, who was in the latter part of the first century, rabbi there, Rabbi Akiba said, 40 years, as long as the Israelites were in the wilderness. So he's comparing the millennium of the Messiah to that wilderness wandering of 40 years. And he says, the Messiah is going to phase out the old age and bring in the new age during a period of 40 year transition like Moses did with the Israelites in the wilderness. Rabbi Eliezer ben Joseph said it would be a hundred years. Rabbi Berechiah said in the name of Rabbi Dosa, 600 years. Rabbi Judah the Prince, 400 years, as long as the Israelites were in Egypt. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, who was another first century rabbi, said a thousand years. Rabbi Abaha, I see, Abahu, well, these words are tough, uh, for a Texan especially. <laughs> Rabbi Abahu said 7,000 years would be the length of time it would take for the Messiah to usher in the age to come. And the rabbis generally declared 2,000 years. And that's from uh, Tractate Tankuma Ekeb. <coughs> Section 7. Other versions of this read this way. Rabbi Eliezer, who was also another first century rabbi, lived or, or uh, ruled or studied and taught from about 80 A.D. to 120 A.D., he said that the days of the Messiah will be 40 years. <laughs> Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah said 70 years. Rabbi Judah the prince said three generations. Rabbi Eleazar said the days of the Messiah will be 40 years. Rabbi Dosa said 400 years and so on. So there's, it's like I was talking to uh, a fellow before uh, we began here. Uh, he was talking about the Jewish rabbis. I forgot your last name on the very back row. Steve. Steve. Talking to Steve and uh, about my experience studying Talmud under uh, Rabbi Silver over here in West Hempstead 40 years ago. And he made the comment one day in, in our Talmudic studies, he says, if there's 50 rabbis in a room, there'll be 51 opinions. <laughs> and I said, well, I know what the 50 opinions are, but what's that 51st opinion? He says, well, there's... There's one right opinion and 50 other opinions. <laughs> but that's what we're seeing here in the rabbinical statements about the Messiah's millennium. There was a lot of different opinions, but there are three rabbis in the first century who understood that millennium to be a 40-year period. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, B.F. Westcott, who's one of the uh, text critics and translators of our New Testament, he made this statement back in 1889. Jewish teachers distinguished a present age from the age to come. And between the present age of imperfection and conflict and trial and, and all that, uh, and the age to come, of the perfect reign, they placed the days of the Messiah. And uh, there's a chart, I think, that's not back on the back, but uh, you can get it. Just sign up on the sheet and I'll send you a copy of this chart that I have that shows how the days of the Messiah fit into the last days of the old age. It was not, the Messiah was not the first days of the new age. He was in the last days of the old age. And he brought that old age to a, to a close and ushered in the age to come. Um, but the rabbis 
were commonly agreed that the passage from one age to the other would be through a period of intense sorrow and ang anguish and uh, the travail pains of the new birth is what they would call it. The, ap the apostolic writers, fully conscious of the spiritual crisis through which they were passing, speak of their own time as the last days. And that was code word for the last days of this age, the old age. Whenever they used that term last days, they were referring to this rabbinical concept of the last days of the old age. And when John in 1 John or 2 John says that we are in the last hour of the last day of the last days, that was really giving them a very clear understanding of where they were in this closing out of the old age and the beginning of the new age to come. Lowe's in his article on the millennium in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that the idea of the millennium, which the divine works out here, is to be understood against the backdrop of the Jewish apocalyptic traditions that he adopts and uses. Notice he says that John is adopting and using the rabbinical concepts here. This is not just Ed Stevens saying this. This is people for the last 200 years who have been analyzing this language and seeing where it comes from. In the expectation of an intermediate messianic kingdom which shall precede the end and the coming of the reign of God, uh, that's where they would place this messianic age. Two times, or two, two forms of eschatological hope were combined in their uh, rabbinical concept. According to the older view, the Messiah will be the end time king, restoring the Davidic monarchy and raising it to new heights. In apocalyptics, however, a very different concept of the future age of salvation develops. On this view, God's envoy will appear from heaven, the dead will rise again at his coming, and all men must come before his judgment seat. And we see that right here in Revelation 20. This is very clearly an apocalyptic uh, rabbinical concept that's being referred to here. Later, an attempt by the rabbis was made to fuse the older nationalistic concept of Davidic kingship with this new apocalyptic eschatology by putting the reign of the Messiah king before the end of the world and the beginning of the new age. And that's exactly what we see in our New Testament. We see that, that newer concept that was beginning to emerge in the first century uh, being put into practice here in our New Testament. The earthly messianic reign will be for a limited term and it will be followed by a last assault of the powers of chaos prior to the commencement of the future world. And so that's, that's the rabbinical concept that's coming into play and that's where these three first century rabbis are drawing from is that apocalyptic imagery that was already there in like the book of Enoch and the uh, Sibylline oracles and uh, the book of Daniel especially in the Old Testament you have this same kind of imagery being used. H.J. Sheps who was a converted Jew back in 1966 uh, in his book on Paul said the traditional views concerning the length of the intermediate messianic kingdom fix a very short interval for that interim period, namely 40 years. And he quotes these three rabbis that we uh, just mentioned and, and quoted. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, Rabbi Akiba, and um, the other one, uh, let's see, I'm trying to see what it is. Rabbi Eliezer, okay, there was two of those guys named Eliezer, different last name though. The two Tanaites, 
commenting on Psalm 95, verse 7, derive this time indication of 40 years from a messianically understood verse 10. Psalm 95, verse 10. Forty years I loathed that generation. And from Deuteronomy 8, 2, by a parallelization with the 40 years in the desert wilderness wandering. So, uh, Sheps is explaining to us how those three first century rabbis derived this idea of 40 years in their understanding. Here's an actual quote from Rabbi Eliezer, who was one of those first three uh, first century rabbis. It has been taught, Rabbi Eliezer said, the days of the Messiah will last 40 years. As it is written, 40 years long shall I take hold of that generation. Another Beretha taught, the days of the Messiah will be 40 years, all the prophets prophesied all the good things only in respect of the messianic era. But as for the world to come, the eye hath not seen, O Lord, besides thee, what he has prepared for them that waiteth for him. Now, he disagrees with Samuel who said, this world differs from that of the days of the Messiah only in respect of servitude to foreign powers. And so... There was a lot of debate about what the Messiah's age would look like when it arrived, and they weren't sure, you know, they didn't know for sure whether it would be apocalyptically oriented or whether it would be simply uh, nationalistically oriented. Okay, I'm going to stop with the rabbinical stuff here. I think you've got the point on that, right? So there was an old age and a new age, and the Messiah was going to arrive at the end of, or the last days of that old age, close it out, bury it, and usher in the age to come. And that transitionary stage between this age and the age to come was referred to as the Messiah's millennium. And we can see from our New Testament that it must have been a 40-year period. And we'll see that. Uh, let's look in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 and following. Notice in Revelation 20, he had said that uh, in verse 2, He laid hold of the dragon, serpent of old, and bound him for a thousand years. Satan was bound for a thousand years. The same thousand years that the saints reign with Christ. It's not two different millenniums here. The Messiah didn't have two different millenniums. No rabbi would have agreed with that. There was only one transitionary stage between this age and the age to come. Okay, Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 through 29. Notice he says, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus. And he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? Now, what is that son of David a reference to? The Messiah, right? Son of David. This guy cannot be the Messiah, can he? Now, if you were Jewish and you heard this reference to the son of David or the Messiah, immediately you're going to start thinking about the Messiah coming to close out the old age and usher in the new age. And they believed that, that the Messiah would perform these kinds of miracles when he came. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, 
He is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? See, because in the first century there was other rabbis who were casting out demons. Jesus wasn't the only one. And so he says, okay, if I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, then who are your Pharisee rabbis using to cast out demons? Boy, that really was a tough question for them to answer. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now notice verse 29, Matthew 12, verse 29. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Then he'll plunder his house. Now what does Jesus tell us that he is doing by casting out demons? He's bound the strong man, right? That's what Revelation 20 is talking about. He laid hold of the dragon and bound him for a thousand years. Why? He had to put him behind him. It's get behind me, Satan. Get out of my way. I'm here to close out the old age and usher in the age to come. And you are in my way. Get out of my face. He bound the strong man and put him out of business for a while. Now, at the end of the millennium, he's going to be released for a short time so that he can come back out and deceive the nations to go to war against his people. And by that time, guess who his people are? It's the Christians. And the neuronic persecution was that very deception. Satan came back out in uh, 63 or so, 64, and deceived the Roman Empire into killing the Christians, going to war against them. Okay, so that's when the millennium began uh, based on Jesus' statement here in Matthew 12, verse 29. It seems that he was binding the strong man right there at that very point, at the beginning of his ministry, which was about 26 A.D. <coughs> Now, one of the passages that really nailed this down for me uh, as a 40-year concept, as a transition period between this age and the age to come, was in 1 Corinthians 15. And this is not a likely place. No one would ever expect a good explanation of the millennium to come from 1 Corinthians 15. But I think you'll see what I'm saying when we get there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15... And look down in verses uh, 28 and following. Actually, 23 and following. And I'm reading out of the New American Standard here. I don't know what version you're using, but he says in verse 23, Each of you, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father and when he has abolished all rule and authority and power for he must reign. Now, 1 Corinthians was written in 57 A.D. That's basically, uh, what, 27 years after the cross and, and the ascension. 57 A.D. And evidently, Paul believed that Jesus was reigning in some sense at the time he wrote 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25. Notice it says, For he must reign, in the Greek that's a present tense, he must continue reigning until what? He has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now, when is death and Hades 
cast into the lake of fire and abolished and done away with at the end of the millennium, right? And here in 1 Corinthians 15, he's connecting that end with the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. That's the same way the Jewish rabbis configured it. So he must reign, verse 25, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now, do you see what Paul is saying? He's defining for us what, what the millennium means. Jesus was already reigning at the time over his millennial reign at the time 1 Corinthians was written. And he must continue that reign until all of his enemies are put down. Now, verse 28 and following, it, it talks about that. Uh, verse 27, he has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he has accepted who, who put all things in subjection to him and when all things are subject to him, to, him, to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. So that sounds very much like what we see in Revelation, where the Messiah rules until all the enemies are put down. He raises the dead puts death and Hades in the lake of fire and judges all men. And then he sits down with the Father to reign with the Father forever and ever afterwards at the, at the end of the millennium. And that's what Paul is alluding to here. There's no indication that Paul had read the book of Revelation yet, though. And uh, I was talking to uh, Glenn Hill earlier about how we decide which book was written first. You know, when there's similar content in both books, how do we decide which one was first? You know, the chicken or the egg? Uh, here in Paul's language, there's no indication. He doesn't use any of the language that we find in Revelation. So there's really no indication that he's already seen the book of Revelation at this point. He is very clearly following the rabbinical concepts, however. And Paul was trained under Gamaliel in Jerusalem, who was a Pharisee rabbi, who was familiar with all these rabbinical concepts that we just talked about. And so we see Paul in 1 Corinthians drawing from that rabbinical Jewish concept, not from what John says about it in the book of Revelation, but they're very compatible. Both of them are drawing from that same Jewish concept. So I think that helps us understand what's happening here and what the millennium is all about. It's a transitionary stage between this age, this old age, and the age to come. And Jesus was in the process of bringing all that uh, out of existence so that he could bring in his new messianic kingdom into existence. All right. Let's see if there's anything else here. I think our time is probably just about up here. I'm going to have to leave off some of this other stuff here. But I think that gives us a fairly good idea of what this language is all about, what the millennium is. It's not something new at all. John assumes that his readers were already familiar with it, and 1 Corinthians 15 shows us that it had to be that period of time between the ascension when Jesus ascended to heaven to begin his millennial reign and his coming again when he would put down all of his enemies and crush them. It's a 40-year reign, basically from 26 A.D. when he began to bind the strong man 
and plunder him of his possessions. And 66 AD, when they saw the angelic armies in the sky signaling the, the parousia had begun. And the parousia wasn't a one-day earth-burning, universe-collapsing event like the futurists think. The parousia was an extended visit of time. It was a coming in judgment against the Jewish nation. And as we noticed uh, in our lesson last night, it was 42 months. That was a 42-month period. Revelation uh, 11 talks about this trampling underfoot the holy city for 42 months uh, as a part of that. So that 42 months was that uh, coming in judgment. It was a parousia, an extended visit. Uh, the word parousia was used in reference to Nero when he went to Greece for their Olympic Games and Olympic contest and dramatic contest. He was a singer and a, 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 a guitar player and he wanted to perform in, in uh, the games in Greece. And so he stayed there for over a year, from one year to the next, so that he could participate in two of their consecutive games. And his visit to Greece for that little over a year, I think it was about a year and a month or so, the Greeks referred to that visit as his parousia. It wasn't a one-day event. It was an extended visitation of a government official or a king or a dignitary. And so that's what we see here. Jesus came in judgment. He began his 42 months of rewarding his saints and pouring out his wrath on his enemies uh, in 66 AD, when they saw the angelic armies in the cloud, that was the signal that he had come, that he was beginning his 42 months of messianic judgment. Okay, I think that'll do it. I think that's probably a little bit over time, so we'll quit there. Thank you very much. <laughs>